Greetings and welcome to Passive Income, The Side Hustles. So what does that mean, Passive Income, The Side Hustles? Well, it means the side hustles that can give you passive income. Passive income meaning you don't have to do a whole lot. You just have income coming in without you doing much. And there's a bunch of different ways to do this, a bunch of what sometimes people call side hustles. So where do you start explaining something like this? Well, I start by explaining it. <laughs> I explain things a little bit differently than most people. So I have my own, you know, deal that I'm going to show you here. So what is this? Aside from an Audio-Technica mic and a Rode boom arm that is set up in my downstairs study. I have two studies in my house. One's a loft study upstairs that you know, when I was married, I promised my wife, kind of, oh, I don't know if I promised her, but I told her one of these days I planned to make her a study up there because the loft is a, it's a, first of all, it's big. It's like 18 by 20 feet or 20 by 22 feet, I forget. Um, but it's really big. It's got a bay window. You can look, you know, down and see the fireplace in the living room. You can look out the bay window and see the whole neighborhood. You could look out the back of the house from there it's just a clean shot to the back of the house it's all open up there and you can see the forest in the backyard you can you know there's skylights up above it's a pretty cool you know area pretty cool space but i never did get that <laughs> built for her so after we got divorced um i kind of went crazy on the house a little bit uh because you know, just because I had some time. It wasn't like, you know, right after we were divorced and I had to celebrate and go out and do a few things. But, you know, shortly after our divorce, I found myself home and not on a project for a couple of weeks. And I just went nuts because, you know, you know, when you're in my line of business, which is consulting and uh, you work on projects all over the country and all over the world, Europe, Asia, when you get off of a project, sometimes it takes, you know, maybe a month to get on another one. And in the meantime, you better take advantage of your time because you're not going to have any time once the new project starts. So I started going crazy working on my house. And, you know, and like in the laundry room, we had a white laundry room, just like when we bought the house. <laughs> Couldn't decide. I guess, you know, we should have, you know, told the builder what, what uh, colors we wanted rooms. But anyways, it had a uh, white and uh, blue floor, <clears throat> and uh, you know I put some blue wallpaper up there and hung some cabinets, you know oak cabinets, and it looks really nice. And you know my my ex-wife used to you know come over all the time. We you know we didn't get divorced because we were fighting a lot or anything like that. We just she had she had needs, <laughs> so. Not, uh, you know, not with men or anything like that. She had a need to be alone and, you know, went pretty deep. So she didn't want to be married anymore. And, you know, that worked out okay with me because I was working in Asia and I kind of like Asian ladies and I didn't argue too much. <laughs> so, but another thing I worked on was the kitchen lighting. I updated all the lighting in the kitchen. And, and this is another thing here in my study. So my downstairs study is all deep burgundy. The, the carpeting is burgundy. The walls are dark burgundy. The drapes here are really a lot darker than they look. I'm, you know, looking at them to my left right now, and they're they're really dark. I can't tell them from the wall. Um, I, they're lightened up a lot in this photo. So, what does that have to do with anything? Well, <laughs> that's how I'm going to explain some side hustles to you. So this is, uh, you know, this isn't about the microphone. You know, this is, uh, you know, just I, I actually bought a few microphones lately. Um, and this is an Audio-Technica microphone and a Rode boom arm that's basically my main microphone that I use for, like, recording, like I'm doing now, or for vlogging or for, you know, talking to, uh, today I talked to a patent attorney and, uh, you know, I've had doctor's appointments at home, and this is like my main area where I do video calls. So, this is a 
dark burgundy drape from Amazon in 2020. That's a little bit significant. So why is it significant? It's a drape from Amazon in 2020. <laughs> it's, it's significant because somehow when we had this house, house built, I, I did the uh, wallpaper in here and it's, you know, deep burgundy, kind of like a pattern down to the like chair rail. And then below that, it's just painted really, you know, darker uh, burgundy <laughs> and the floor is dark burgundy. You know, this is like a, it's like a man's room. And instead of everything being brown, you know, in earth tones, like the rest of the house, um, I decided to go with color. And, you know, the deep burgundy kind of is a cool study, you know, it's dark. It's, you know, I, I don't turn on the above lamps or lights very often. I, I just have, you know, two lights on my desk, desk lamps, and I only use one of them and I have a lit keyboard and I'm happy. So it's a dark room. It's kind of masculine, but for years I wasn't happy with the drapes, you know, because I just couldn't find, you know, I thought drapes would be easy. You know, you pick out the carpet, you pick out the paint, you pick out the wallpaper, you've got a deep burgundy room and the drapes are not as deep their burgundy as I wanted. They're like a dark red. <laughs> so, and they're not thermal. So they don't, you know, they don't do much behind these drapes are some burgundy room darkening blinds. But they don't stop noise like, you know, little kids playing. And I just wanted something, you know, really heavy drapes to hang there to kind of give me some privacy and make the room darker and quieter. So here was the issue, you know, for 10 years <laughs> when I was looking for drapes. So I just put in a couple. I, I, do, I don't remember all of the places where I looked for drapes, but I remember I would just get on this, you know, thing every so often that I need to find drapes and I would look for, you know, a half hour and then I'd say, forget it. So this is JC Penney, you know, uh, drapes. I looked up burgundy drapes. Okay. And, um, we found zero for drapes burgundy. Okay. Um, didn't matter what I put in burgundy drapes or drapes burgundy. And then you could go to the color down on the bottom left and they only have about, you know, maybe nine colors or something. And one of them is red. So you can choose red and then you can look through all the red drapes and you're not going to find any burgundy drapes. So this is what was frustrating is I just couldn't find anything dark enough. Nothing really, really dark. So here's, here's bed, bath and beyond and you know burgundy drapes i looked up and it comes up with 13 drapes but already <laughs> the, the one in the middle is like you know a pink uh, i guess it's you know red and white checkered like a kitchen window it's not a drape so already they're straying from what i'm looking for and they only found 13 things so this is what it was like for like a decade where you know i always wanted to get burgundy drapes it's not like i look for them every day but it was just one of those frustrating things one of these days i'm going to find deep burgundy drapes that are you know insulated you know with foam or something or insulated with something i don't remember what they're insulated with but they're really heavy and they deaden noise and they they block any light coming in from the back so you know, it was just frustrating for me, you know, to, it was like something I was never going to find for my house. So why is that? Well, because, you know, people have, you know, Amazon and, you know, JCPenney and Beds, Bath and Beyond, they have corporate buyers. So what are corporate buyers? Well, they're people that work in a corporation. They buy stuff, you know, from resellers or from manufacturers, sometimes wholesalers that you know provide drapes or sometimes directly from the manufacturer that's what they do they buy things to sell on their sites because they're resellers so here's just a couple things you can look up you know it isn't my intent here to explain what a corporate buyer does but what a corporate buyer does is you know buy stuff to sell if it's a retail company of course if it's a manufacturing company a corporate buyer is going to buy you know raw materials and things get a little more complicated you know, if you're a company like, you know, Intel, 
you know, you might buy some raw materials that are a little bit more high tech than drapes. So you might, you know, the corporate buyers might be, you know, engineers instead of, you know, people that buy drapes. So anyways, you can look this up if you want to. But the reason that, you know, I was limited looking at JCPenney and Be Beds, Bath and & Beyond and other, you know, I, I forgot it, to put Macy's in here. That would have been one of my first choices. But same same deal everywhere I looked. I just couldn't find anything. And, you know, that's because the buyers were doing what the buyers before them did. And that's buying drapes from, you know, wholesalers or re resellers uh, or manufacturers, just like the buyer, you know, just like the buyer before and the buyer before and the buyer before. Nobody's finding anything different. You know, it's just basically the same stuff year after year. So... Picture yourself as a corporate buyer and you're working for Amazon. So here's Amazon. And I just, you know, I, I've been upgrading a lot of uh, audio and video equipment. Um, and, you know, audio uh, has just been my hobby for the last few years. There's several home theaters in my house and I've upgraded all of them recently, except all of them, except for two, actually. So, you know, one of them is the main system in the family room, and I didn't upgrade it because, you know, it needs like a, a big 100-inch TV, and, you know, there's MagnaPan speakers in there. It's a really, you know, a, a bunch of powerful amps, and I, I basically couldn't do anything when I'm sitting in the family room. You know, it's kind of built for watching movies. And there's, you know, I could take a notebook PC in there with me, but, you know, it wouldn't be like sitting here, you know, at my desk. And, you know, the, there's another room. I'm waiting to move the uh, weight room down the basement, building a new room down there. So I already bought the, the system for that. But the other four home theaters in the house are all done. Then I started building a, um, or putting together a uh, studio for photography and videography in the upstairs loft. So I, I've bought some cameras and I'm all, you know, Canon and Nikon out right now <laughs> so, because I did a lot of studying on what I wanted to buy. So I thought I would take a look at something simple here like Kodak. And you can see there's, you know, Kodak makes some really good cameras. You know, they always have. So uh, I don't really have a really good point and shoot camera. I have a, you know, a, an old Nikon that I keep in my motorcycle, my Harley. But uh, I, I don't really have anything small to carry around with me that does video. So I should get something like this. But the point here was to show you a corporate buyer that's ahead, you know, that's in charge of buying, you know, digital cameras for something like Amazon. It's not like you're going to change the world here. You know, you have a limited list here of cameras that they offer, you know, Kodak, Canon, Nikon, Sony. Those would be your big ones. And, you know, if you're a new buyer, you know, working in your first job as a buyer or maybe you're a buyer at a smaller company and you move to Amazon, you know, you're not going to, you know, go to China and buy a new digital camera from the, uh, you know, Shenzhen, you know, digital camera company because, you know, it's risky. You know, nobody knows, you know, the, there's no doubt a bunch of Chinese companies that you know, copy American technology and Japanese technology and, you know, they make digital cameras. But, you know, you're not going to, you know, reinvent the wheel here. You're basically limited to what the buyer before you used to buy <laughs> because, you know, so, so you know, and, and the idea is to get good deals, you know, get buy in big numbers because you're Amazon and you've got power and you're just not going to change much. You know, if you're replacing a buyer who left or, you know, moved, got promoted, now a director or something, and you've you've got to basically do the same thing that that buyer was doing all along. You can't really reinvent anything. You're not going to find any new products out there because there aren't any. You know, there aren't any that aren't risky. Then, <laughs> this was going back to 2020 and my original point, I just looked up, you know, burgundy drapes just now, but I remember doing it in 2020 and I thought, what the hell? What what happened? <laughs> I look up burgundy drapes, 390. And, and if you can see the, the bottom arrow here, I've already 
narrowed it down to solid color and I've already narrowed it down to uh, something else, I forget. But, and there's still 390 results here for burgundy drapes. Now, hot, and it's even deep burgundy. So how the heck did that happen? How did that happen? You know, I spent a decade trying to find burgundy drapes and and nothing, you know, nothing much. I had to live with the dark red drapes that I had that were, were not dark enough and they weren't heavy enough and they didn't do anything I just didn't like them. So what happened in 2020? All of a sudden, there's like a zillion burgundy drapes here on Amazon. And and what happened is, you know, the side hustle. So in 2020, Amazon opened up to affiliate marketing. So what is affiliate marketing? You know, it's a big buzz now. It's one of the, the side hustles, you know, one of the ways to make passive income. But what it is, is Amazon decided, hey, we're going to open up our, you know, site, which is, you know, my, I think they're the second biggest retailer in the world because I think Walmart is still first. So, you know, they opened up to affiliate marketing, which means not only did they have their own corporate buyers looking for things like window treatments, they have everybody else on the planet that wants to be an affiliate uh, marketer, you know. So the job of an affiliate marketer is to go out into the world somewhere and find things that the corporate buyers aren't finding. And, and once they find them, they put them on Amazon site. So you know, you can look at these things and you wouldn't know, you know, which products here are are by Amazon corporate buyers and which products are affiliate marketing. They, they all look the same. But let's just say the first one, maybe that's, you know, from an affiliate marketer. And maybe if you go in here and it, it says sort by featured, if you sort by, you know, maybe the top buy, the top selling uh, you would find a whole different order and, but they don't still all, you know, you were still talking about 390 burgundy drapes, deep burgundy drapes. <laughs> so maybe the first one's by an affiliate marketer. Now, what is an affiliate marketer? There's somebody that went out into the world and found burgundy drapes and decided I'm going to put these on Amazon because they're cool and they're high quality and they're not too, too expensive. They're a good buy for the money. And I'm going to just borrow a space on Amazon site. And customers will be looking at my products along with other affiliate marketer products and along with corporate buyers. And these affiliate marketers, you know, they make some money because they're buying directly from a, a supplier or a wholesaler or they're buying directly from a manufacturer. So they're making 30% on every sale. And that's typical. You know, 30% might even be low. Uh, 30, 40 percent, something like that is the markup. You know, if something goes, you know, from a manufacturer to a wholesaler to Amazon and, you know, you're making a lot of money and it's passive income. So what else is good about affiliate marketing is you put your stuff up here on Amazon or Walmart. Now, Walmart didn't go to affiliate marketing until 2021. They got smart. They saw Amazon's making a boatload of money. <laughs> And they better do the same thing or they're going to be left out. So in 2021, about a year ago, because it's it's March of 2022 right now. I think it was in March of 2021 when when uh, uh, Walmart decided to, you know, accept affiliate marketers. So what what affiliate marketers do as a as a customer is they give you a lot more variety like a zillion times more variety than what you would have with just Amazon and their corporate buyers. And what your job is, is an affiliate uh, marketer, affiliate buyer, you can look at it as that, um, is to go out and find things, you know, to basically outperform the corporate buyers, find things that are better, you know, that you can uh, set the cost on it, you know what the cost is to you, and, and what happens is customers buy it. It's shipped from an Amazon warehouse, just like everything else. It's, you know, the sale and the shipping and everything is taken care of by Amazon. Customer service is taken care of by Amazon. That's why they call it passive income. You don't do anything, <laughs> you know. You shop for products, and once you find a product and you put it up on Amazon, you know, 
customers will buy things from you. So, and you can even advertise, you know, to boost your sales. You can advertise outside of Amazon and say, look at these high quality drapes. They're, you know, they're made by a brand new company in Mexico, real cheap labor, real high quality stuff. And, you know, point toward your, toward your product, you know, do something like that on uh, TikTok or something, you know, and, and make a little advertisement, or you can buy ads for Amazon, you know, and point to your product. And the more you spend on advertising, the more money you're going to make. But, you know, you don't have to spend money sometimes. You just point to your product, customers will buy it, and you'll make the money. You know, you just get money put in your account, and you don't do anything because you're not doing the sale, you're not doing the shipping, you're not doing the, you know, warehousing. It's passive income to you. So as a summary, for many years, I didn't buy drapes from Amazon due to a poor selection. Same as every other, you know, retailer that I looked at, like JCPenney and whatever else I looked at, uh, Macy's. When Amazon went to an affiliate marketing program, I did buy from Amazon. Why? Because they had this, you know, huge selection, 390 different deep burgundy drapes. So I found what I wanted. So affiliate marketing is good for Amazon. They're making sales because of it. It's good for affiliate marketers because they're making 30, 40% on every sale. And it's good for customers because they can find what they want. So you might be wondering why I'm showing this picture or why I showed a drape at the beginning, um, because I have a reason. So it just so happened while I'm making this presentation here, I had another session still open from a couple days ago. Um, you know, today it's March 4th, 2022, but I started making this, uh, you know, a couple days ago, say on March 2nd. And I was also watching a video from this guy. So this is a YouTube dude that I'm, that I follow. His name is Ben or Benjamin. And he has a channel called Bald and Bankrupt. <laughs> and he, his gig is, he's a British citizen. I think he lives in the London area. And he is, you know, he's got Russian blood and he, his gig is going around Russia and looking for old Soviet stuff. Soviet buildings that are abandoned, you know, that's his favorite thing to do. He doesn't go to big cities like, you know, Moscow or Petersburg, St. Petersburg. They call it Petersburg. Um, he doesn't go to big cities like that. He doesn't go to any big cities anywhere, you know, in Russia. And he just goes to these, you know, remote cities to, you know, because he looks up and finds these old Russian abandoned buildings. And he also looks for cities that have like a, a bunch of mosaics, like uh, Soviet mosaics, you know, on the walls, you know, um, Russia, you know, USSR. So he, his whole thing is, you know, showing everybody, you know, all these uh, Soviet era things. And he goes crazy when he sees this stuff. And, you know, I've, I've been to Russia a lot and, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, video shots here of the, Ru uh, the Russian uh, or Ukrainian subway system, same as Russia. You know, they have these, uh, really ornate, uh, subway stations. You go way down underground really deep and, you know, the subway stations are really elaborate. So, he, you know, I follow him because he's just entertaining, but you know, for years <laughs> I've been, I've been following him for years and for years, I'm, you know, I'll always comment when he's like underdressed. So he'll end up, you know, being, uh, somewhere in Northern Siberia where he lands, uh, you know, and, and his, his, uh, itinerary was to, to travel South, you know, to, you know, to a warmer climate, you know, or take an airplane and then the flight gets canceled and he's, here he is staying overnight in Siberia somewhere with a, a thin jacket on, <laughs> or maybe it's raining and, you know, his jacket's getting all soaked. And, you know, I keep commenting, why don't you buy a North Face system? You know, just, you know, you've got a outer coat that's usually waterproof, an outer shell, and then you have a, you know, a parka, and then underneath that, you have a zip-out, you know, medium-weight um, coat. So I have a, you know, a 
North Face system. The outside is, you know, dark blue and black. And, um, you know, that's the shell is uh, waterproof. And then there's a zip out thing underneath that. And then there's a, a base layer. So it's just good if you're going to be traveling around Russia to have something like this. But this is the first time ever that he's finally bought a North Face <laughs> jet coat. So I, you know, I just left this open. I was, I think I was finished watching the video, but it just reminded me of affiliate marketing. So, you know, here this guy is, he, you know, he, he, he went to Poland, I think, and then he took a train to Lviv, which is way west in Ukraine. And then he had to take a train across the country to Kiev or Kiev, however you want to say it, uh, you know. Uh, I've heard Russian people call it Kiev, you know, but most people call it Kiev now. I don't know. The Russian way of saying I think it's Kiev. So, you know, he that's the capital. So he takes a train to the capital and he hooks up with Johnny, his American buddy. And uh, here they are enjoying the day. And then they shot this video on day two. Day two <laughs> is when the invasion starts. So he, he gets there to Ukraine. Uh, you know, kind of as a joke, you know, he's saying that the British government and American intelligence are all saying that an invasion is imminent, that they are going to invade the Ukraine. Russia is. But, you know, he didn't he didn't think that was actually going to happen. So he decides to go to the capital um, and he didn't think that Russia would try to capture a capital. But that's their main target. So here he is, you know, in a North Face coat, walking around an abandoned, you know, city in in you know right in the downtown area and he just he says you know only a few stops away you know uh, subway stops away you know there's russian tanks you know killing people <laughs> so here he is on the right this is a i think a train station and you know that's another thing about russia they have these elaborate look at this oh this is actually ukraine but it's you know part of the former soviet union so their train stations are elaborate like this too typical russian looking uh train station so here he is pointing to the people down on the floor below him he said this is like 1939 <laughs> you know with you know people you know scrambling around thousands of people crowded everywhere and you know their whole gig here is to get out of town to get they're going to go south instead of going all the way across ukraine again they're going to go south and get out of the country so I decided to look up, let's look up North Face and see, you know, if they have an affiliate program. So that's the whole, that's the whole idea from that. It just happened to be a video that I had open when I'm making this video. So I thought, hey, let's look at this. So when I, I looked at North Face, the first, th the first hit that I came to was REI, which is another, you know, uh, North Face sells coats directly, but so does REI. Um, REI sell, sells a lot of their own coats and, and then they sell North Face because they're, they're an outdoor company. So I looked up the North Face coats on here and then if you scroll down to the bottom of a page, just about, you know, any site where you can buy directly from a manufacturer, um, you know, just scroll all the way to the bottom and you can see on the bottom right, or the, the bottom right photo, the big red arrow, it says affiliate program. So that means they have an affiliate program. So when you see something like this, this link, I didn't, I didn't go into this because I know what happens. It takes you through a bunch of stuff where, you know, you can sign up to be an affiliate uh, marketer um, and you can uh, get access to a bunch of videos. You can pick out a product that maybe you want to sell on another site, maybe on Facebook. Maybe you're going to pay, you know, $5 for a couple day ad on Facebook and show a picture of a North Face coat. And if somebody clicks on it, they're going to go right to the the uh, North Face uh, little video on, on the coat. They'll show you how the system, the coat system works. And then you click on that. Okay, let's buy it. Then it takes you right to the, you know, REI sales site. So that's how this affiliate stuff works. There's, you know, the, the page would be a landing page where you show the video, you know, that's your page. That's exclusive to you. So you have, you put an ad in 
uh, on Facebook or you, you know, you make a YouTube video with an ad or you even do a TikTok video and you click on that. And then the next thing you see is a landing page and the landing page is where you show maybe a little bit of product information that comes from the manufacturer a lot of times or a reseller. And then the people see a little video and think, yeah, this is a cool coat. Let's buy it. So you click on that and then you go right to the site to buy it. So that's your, you know, how affiliate marketers make their income. So when you see an affiliate program down like this, down at the bottom of a page, that means it's usually pretty sophisticated where they have all this stuff set up for you, all the links and everything. All you need to do is, you know, get people to click on your link. So I just wanted to show you, I went to the North Face site this time instead of REI. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they don't have an affiliate link at the bottom, but then if you Google it, does North Face have an affiliate program? Yes, they do. So, you know, you just have to, if you don't see the affiliate link, you know, don't assume that they don't have an affiliate program. Just Google it and find it, and then you can get set up as an affiliate marketer and sell stuff and make money. Then another thing I always tell Ben is why do you wear like high top shoes, you know, or, or just athletic shoes when you're walking around in the snow in Siberia? And again, it's usually because he gets dumped off somewhere <laughs> and he's got to walk a, or he does that intentionally. He's got to walk a few miles so he can show you the name of the town he's going in. There's a big sign with the name of a town and he'll be walking along, a you know, a highway in in the Soviet Union in Siberia in in a pair of athletic shoes <laughs> so uh, you know I always tell them why don't you why don't you buy a pair of Timberlands you know they're hiking boots they're lightweight they're as lightweight as the athletic shoes that you wear but these are ankle high they'll keep your you know ankle from getting twisted and you know if you watch some of his videos he's walking around in abandoned buildings and the flooring you know isn't isn't like it used to be you know it's torn up and stuff like that so or sometimes it's dirt and rocks because people have stole the you know the flooring the hardwood or something so you know you know always i happen to be uh you know in a, a bunch of harley groups and i'm always you know every time somebody uh writes in and says you know what harley boot do you recommend you know and harley harley boots are enormously heavy big rubber soled boots with heavy leather and you know I'm, I'm telling people you know what makes a better boot for riding is a waterproof black timberland boot that's really lightweight and waterproof you can actually wear it in the rain while you're riding and you know you can walk for all day in it if you have to so anyways i i just went up to timberland and i sorted the boots by i did one sort and that was waterproof so these are all the waterproof boots and you know if you're riding a harley probably black looks pretty good but here i scroll down to the bottom of the page and i don't see a timber i don't see an affiliate program at the bottom of their page i see the about section and i just don't see any affiliate program so i thought well maybe they don't have it maybe maybe they don't do affiliate but then if you just Google it, and what I did here is Google Timberland Affiliate Program, and the number one hit was this hit, <laughs> because it's exactly what I searched for. Timberland Affiliate Program. Does Timberland have uh, you know, a, an affiliate program? And then the second arrow you see, it says, yes, they do. And they give you the links here. So, you know, just, you, you never know who's going to have an affiliate program and who's not. Just Google it. If you can't, if you, if you scroll down to the beginning of their home page, that's usually where you see an affiliate link. If you don't see one, just Google and they'll give you a link. So it's maybe just something that they don't put on their main page. So passive income, the side hustles, affiliate marketing is only one of the side hustles that you can use to, you know, get passive income. There's many more. So, you know, the whole idea of affiliate marketing is you are going to find stuff that you think will sell and you can sell from sites like Walmart or Amazon or any site that has an affiliate program. 
And, you know, like I said, it's only one of the side hustles. There are many more, and we're going to take a look at some other ones. Okay, another side hustle that makes a lot of people a lot of money is uh, coaching and master classes, expert classes. Now, coaching, I mean, you know, not necessarily sports coaching, um, but, you know, life coaching and stuff like that. So I'm going to just throw this all into the same category, some kind of, you know, teaching, coaching, master class type stuff. So uh, first I went with uh, just looking up master classes and I wound up with uh, uh, the screen on the left where, you know, a bunch of people have ranked master classes. So I, you know, that's probably a good place to start. So the top one, 41 master classes ranked and reviewed. And just to give you an idea of what's available, uh, this is a lady photographer, Annie Lieb, Lieb, Liebowitz. I think you'd say Lieb. It sounds like a German name. Um, so, you know, this is a class on, you know, photography, master class on photography. And I've seen a lot of these. I'm kind of a photographer myself. Um, a lot of them uh, are, you know, teaching lighting and stuff like that. But... You know, you don't have to necessarily put together a master class to teach photography. You know, there's a lot of good people out there to teach, you know, lighting and poses and, you know, for portrait photography or, you know, wildlife photography, stuff like that. So this is just a general photography class here that probably goes over. Oh, it looks like she's got a medium format camera here. <laughs> um, looks like it goes over, you know, everything. Then we have Carlos Santana teaching the art and soul of guitar master class. Jody Foster, filmmaking. So sometimes being famous helps if you're going to teach a master class. But, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I know these people, but I'm not going to know everybody. So I'm not going to say whether they're famous or not because <laughs> it'll only embarrass myself. Howard Schultz teaches business leadership. So he's uh, the guy behind Starbucks. So he teaches the class Wolfgang Puck. There's no uh, there's no graphic here, but I know he's a cook or a chef or whatever you want to call him. Natalie Portman teaches acting and then Martin Scorsese uh, teaches filmmaking. Jimmy Chen teaches adventure photography. Now that's somebody that I'm not familiar with, um, but he might be famous in his, you know, in, as far as an adventure photographer. Maybe I've seen a lot of work of his because I've seen a lot of, you know, photography uh, classes or photography, you know, little short snippets <laughs> on doing, you know, photography, you know, people hanging upside down you know, in rock climbing and stuff like that. So he might be responsible for a lot of that stuff, but I just don't know who he is in particular. Uh, Shonda Rhimes, uh, writing for television. Dr. Jane Goodall teaches conservation. And I've seen her in a few of these classes, you know, so obviously that's a pretty good one. Margaret Atwood teaches creative writing. Gordon Ramsay teaches cooking master class. So, you know, I, I do cook a lot myself and I cook um, by watching people, but I don't cook by watching Gordon Ramsay <laughs> or, you know, Wolfgang Puck or anyone else that's really famous. I, I follow a girl, um, you know, Pylan's Hot Thai Kitchen. She teaches Thai cooking. And I, I like Thai food, so I do a lot of Thai cooking at home. You know, my favorite maybe is, uh, you know, red curry chicken. So that's something that she fixes. And, you know, it's it's nice, you know, being able to, to follow something like that. You know, I should get into, you know, Chinese cooking more. I've been in China more than anywhere else. Um, and China, you know, has some unbelievable cooking. But I didn't see any master classes for Chinese cooking. You know, I, you don't see that many classes for Chinese cooking at all, despite the fact that, you know, they might be the the people that founded, you know, most cooking styles in Asia, you know. 
but Thailand usually wins. You know, CNN puts out a uh, a list every year of the the 50 top dishes in the world, and Thailand kind of dominates that. So Thai food is you know really famous and it's you know really good, and that's why I like to cook it. Steve Martin teaches comedy master class. Malcolm Gladwell teaches writing. Chris Hadfield teaches space exploration. So, you know, this is a guy that's also in a, in a few of these lists of master classes. I'm just going through the, the top one. I'm not going to go through every list that I saw of, you know, master classes. But, you know, I, I did go through, you know, five or six of them myself. I'm just not going to present them here because they're kind of all the same. So Hadfield is that Canadian uh, astronaut that, you know, he's famous for, you know, singing Space Odyssey, the David Bowie song. <laughs> he's just, he's probably the most famous astronaut in the world. You, you know, he's Canadian and he was, you know, at the International Space Station for a long time. He's a, you know, career astronaut and he's just good at it. Daniel Negre Negrino? Neg Negrino, Negrono, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know the guy. Teaches poker, so, you know, I'm not really into poker. <laughs> Helen Mirren teaches acting classes, acting master class. James Patterson teaches writing. Ron Howard teaches directing. Neil Gaiman, Gaiman? Gaiman? Teaches the art of storytelling. So that's kind of interesting. Gary Pas Kasparov, Kasparov teaches a uh, chess master class. Tom Moreau teaches electric guitar master class. Uh, Ken Burns teaches documentary filmmaking. So that would be something that I might be interested in. Not that I want to be a documentary filmmaker. See, most master classes you take because you want to do it, not just because you want to watch. And, you know, that's why it's a master class teach, teaching people. So documentaries are, you know, probably 75% of what I watch. Uh, you know, I don't really watch TV. I've got a TV here every time I, I haven't turned it on in maybe two months. Every time I turn it on, <laughs> it's a Vizio TV and it, it you know, it changes <laughs> stuff. The navigation changes because Vizio is always messing around with the navigation. And, uh, you know, they add new channels and, you know, new networks, basically, that I don't know about. So every time I turn it on, I have to figure out how to use it again. But I do have, for some reason, six home theaters in my house. Ken Burns teaches documentary filmmaking. So, you know, that might be interesting. But, you know, you got to pay for these classes. They're not free. They're, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Dan Brown teaches thriller writing classes. So this is the last one in that list. This is the number one. They went through 41. I didn't include all 41. You know, I went from, you know, I don't know. I, I, I had maybe 15. <laughs> then there's, you know, some off the wall stuff. Like this is a master class for character art. <clears throat> so if you're going to, you know, make Star Wars figures or, you know, whatever this guy is, <laughs> then looks like he's from the movie Dune, maybe Dune 2. So, uh, I didn't see that movie, by the way. I'm just, he looks kind of like a Dune character because of the, the, the outfits are kind of, you know, uh, you know, archaic. So this is a $250 thing. I don't know what everybody else's is, you know, the, the cooking classes by Gordon Ramsay. I don't know what, what that runs, but you know, they do cost some money. Then I thought I'd pick another list that might be you know, interesting. This is PC Magazine picking a master class. And, you know, I went through all these. Uh, Bob Woodard, Woodward, uh, investigative journalism, and Christina Aguilera singing. Then LinkedIn. Now, this is, you know, I thought this would be way different. 10 master classes to help you be better at your job. You know, LinkedIn is a job thing site. So I thought all these would, you know, help you get better at your job, like, you know, life coaching type stuff or, you know, how to, you know, effective speaking or something like that. But it tended to be more of the other, you know, more of the same. <clears throat> so David Mamet teaches uh, uh, dramatic writing. 
Hadfield, I included him just to include him. He's he's probably in you know four or five of the lists that I saw. That's the Canadian uh, uh, astronaut teaches space exploration. Will Wright teaches game design in theory. So you know this would be a good thing to watch. You know if you're you know if you're a big time gamer and you're young and you're thinking about going to college to learn how to you know write games. That you know there's a lot of money in it if you're good. You know there's it's probably like most professions where the top, you know, 10% make make all the money. But uh, this might be interesting as a career choice. So as a summary for um, coaching and master class, is teaching a master class or, a, you know, as a side hustle, is it for everyone? Well, maybe not. You know, clearly there are some areas where it pays to be famous. You know, Ron Howard is a director, or, you know, Jodie Foster is a, you know, teaching acting. So, you know, it, it does pay to be famous. It pays to have a lot of experience and, you know, famous actors and actresses have a lot of experience. Um, and then there's, you know, but there's other people that could actually, that are qualified maybe to teach a master class that aren't famous. And, and you know, maybe this is a gig for somebody. You know, I try to think about, you know, what I would be, you know, good at. I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't really, I'm not a master of anything. I do know how to engineer pretty well, and I file patents. And, you know, so sometimes I can outthink people. And, you know, if I, I I've worked on uh, projects before, and, you know, it's not, it's not like I hold back and don't tell a company about a product that, you know, would be good, like, say, in the automotive industry where I spend a lot of time. Um, but, you know, I was working at a, a medical institution and and I saw something, you know, being unboxed and I actually helped help people put stuff together and I saw something that, would, that gave me a good idea for the automotive industry. It hasn't been done in the automotive industry yet, but it's in the medical industry. So I filed a patent on it. So anyways, you know, I, I file patents and, you know, maybe I could do woodworking. Maybe I could do tuning. You know, I'm pretty good at tuning a Harley and other things, sports car. But, you know, I, I, I don't really have a burning desire to teach a master class. But maybe you could. You know, maybe this could be a good side hustle for you. So, um, you know, I say maybe not, you know, it might not be for you, but maybe, you know, maybe 30 years of experience would qualify you to teach a master class or maybe 10 years. Say you're an architect, you know, and you're not a famous architect <clears throat> because you're not like, you know, the, the founder of an architectural firm. But say you've been an architectural engineer or structural engineer all your life and you know how to design buildings. <laughs> and uh, I know a few things about architecture because I've worked on projects like that. But, you know, if you've d been doing it for 30 years, you could probably teach architecture, you know, and, you know, you might not be famous, but you could teach it just as well as somebody who's got an, a firm named after themselves. Or you could, you know, maybe you're a school teacher and you've been a school teacher for 30 years and you have this knack for, you know, teaching grade schoolers and keeping their attention and you're really popular and you win all these awards, then you're, you know, you're qualified to teach a master class. You don't have to be famous. Travel vloggers, you know, if you've been doing that for 10 years, you're ahead of most people. <laughs> so you could probably teach a master class. Life coach, you know, I don't think that's been around for more than 10 years. So 10 years experience might be enough. You know, you might be a good, you might be able to teach a master class, you know, in being a life coach. So it's, you know, it's a possibility, but most of the examples that we saw are not a possibility because, you know, you're not a famous chef. <laughs> so I could probably teach Thai cooking. You know, I, I, I might do something like that. I, I've actually made a video on it uh, just to show people how your kitchen has to be set up to do Asian food because, you know, there's all kinds of different things that you need to stock in your fridge, all kinds of different you know, fish sauces and stuff like all kinds of different spices, you know, that you have to, you know, keep at hand, even oils, cooking oils and, and woks and stuff like that. So, you know, maybe I could teach a class in, in Asian cooking or in Thai cooking because I've been doing it for a long time. But it's not for everybody. And, and all the examples that we saw are 
typically not for anybody except for real famous people. But that doesn't mean that you can't teach a master class. So it could be a gig for you. Then one thing, um, this is just something that reminded me of, you know, somebody that I think ought to teach a master class, and he actually does. This is uh, Rick Beato and Beato with a T. I didn't mean to say that wrong. It sounded like a D. I, I said Beato, Beato. I just didn't say it correctly. So anyways, I've been following this guy for a long time. He, he uh, does a series. He's a like a music analyst, and he did this series. Uh, he's got 2.8 million followers now, <laughs> subscribers. You know, when I started following him, he had a couple hundred thousand. So, but he used to do this thing, a series called "What Makes This Song Great," and and you know he would take a like a 24 track, the original 24 track, or he would he would get a hold of a master and he has the equipment that he could probably break it down. And you know, he, what he does is you know he'll talk about a song, and then he'll play things like he'll play only the drum beat or you know only you know only a keyboard or only a rhythm guitar, or only backup voices, uh, vocals. So, you know, he has, you know, like a 24-track <laughs> in his studio here, and he has a zillion guitars. This isn't a real good picture of a studio because his guitars line up a whole side of it. And actually, I think he's looking the other way than he usually does. He's got the different, a different background there. But anyways, he does these things, you know, what makes this song great, episode two here, The Police, and uh, I think he's on episode 130 now, since he, so he's done a lot of those. And it's amazing that he's got so many followers because he's a rock guy. You know, he's always doing these videos like, is rock dead or will rock ever come back? Or do we just have the, the crap that we listen to today? And, and on the right is one of his master classes, Music Theory Master Class. Now... I just queued that up and I didn't watch it. I should because, you know, I should watch a lot of things from him because, you know, I have a guitar. I have a, a Strat, you know, sitting in a case here in front of me. It's I keep it in the front of my desk <laughs> um, because it's out of the way. You know, it's kind of big to put in a lot of different places. So it's I have an overhang on the desk and, you know, it's underneath the overhang in the front of the desk where nobody ever sees it. And, you know, there's an amp sitting there, a little Fender amp sitting there, too. So, um, you know, I should get it out and play, but I just don't have time. But anyways, this is a guy who teaches a master class that I really want to see that I haven't yet. And I just thought I would mention it. You, maybe you have some people that, that are your favorite YouTubers. Maybe they have a master class. Okay, next, we're going to talk about the biggest side hustle out there, and that's YouTube. So we'll take a look at a few things here. Um, if you just Google YouTube, <laughs> you'll find a bunch of YouTubers. Most followers, uh, you can Google YouTube most followers and YouTube most views and YouTube highest earning. We're going to take a look at most followers and highest earning. So first we're going to look at the number of subscribers. So number one, this guy named PewDiePie. <laughs> who has a crazy 110 million subscribers, which is just, you know, astronomical. I mean, you know, if you've got a million subscribers, like some of the people that I follow, that's a lot, you know, one to two million. But 110 million is just crazy. And then number two, number three, and number four are all going to be in the children's entertainment realm. So this doesn't necessarily mean they make a lot of money because... You know, you make a lot of money on YouTube when advertisers pay to put advertisements in your videos. And, you know, children's entertainment wouldn't wouldn't usually be the top earners. But anyways, at number two, as far as subscribers goes, 81.4 million. So when you have numbers like that, <laughs> you're a top earner no matter what, because <laughs> 81.4 million is a boatload of subscribers. So this is a Kids Diana show. Then at number three and number four, more children's entertainment. Number three, like Nastia. So Nastia, naturally, is a Eastern European name. Um, it's like a cute name for uh, Natalia, I think. All, all the uh, Russian names, you know, have a, have a cute name. I guess ours do, too, Western names. Number four, Vlad and Nikki, 70.1 million. 
So, you know, crazy numbers here for the number of subscribers. It's hard, hard to imagine. Then number five, Mr. Beast, who is a basically a random video influencer. He's all over the board as far as, you know, putting out videos. 65.2 million. Dude Perfect, um, sports entertainment. He's always doing something sports related. By the way, I, I, I never watched any of these. <laughs> so I just read about them and I hear about them. And, you know, this isn't the first list that I've seen them on. Because I'm a little bit familiar with, you know, ranking YouTubers. So Dude Perfect at number six with 56.5 million. Again, you know, these are really big numbers for the number of subscribers. Number seven. I don't know what this is. Hola Soy German and whatever. Yuga. I don't know what that says. I covered it up. German. Anyways, at 43.9 million, this is a, um, a Chilean guy. German, <laughs> German Garmendia is Chile's biggest YouTube star. So comedy here. Looks pretty funny. And then number eight at 42.7 million is a singer and entertainer. Um, Right behind Gar, let's see, where's he from? Is he from the same place? Uh, Winder, Winder Sanins, Sanins, Sanins. I don't even know what that is. Oh, Brazilian again. So yeah, so forty-two point seven million um, for a singer who does comedy also. Number nine. Felipe Nato, Neto, Nato, Nato, probably Nato, 42.6 million subscribers, just general entertainment here, but it looks like he's, you know, a gamer too. A Portuguese Brazilian influencer. And number 10, Fernand Flo, uh, 42.5 million subscribers, gaming and entertainment again. And he's Salvadorian, Salvadoran, I mean, sorry. So, like I said, these aren't necessarily the most important YouTubers, and neither are, you know, the ones that are coming up next, the highest income YouTubers. The most important thing to realize here is there's a lot of people using YouTube to make a, a lot of money. But we'll take a look at the highest income ones next. Now, there's there's a zillion different people that rate, you know, the the you know the most viewers, and you know, depending on how they do that, or the most you know followers. And, the, and, you know, the highest earning, there's different ways of, you know, calculating the highest earning. And then there's also, you know, you can earn money outside of YouTube from being a famous YouTube person. So, like, you know, we'll take a look at some boxers here that are, you know, earning money boxing, but they're also YouTube stars. So, you know, the important thing is to realize that there's a lot of money in YouTube. So let's take a look at this. And we're going to look at Forbes because... Forbes has been coming out with a list of the top earners for a long time, and it's really the only one I've ever looked at. <laughs> but I've been looking at it for, you know, a few years now. So according to Forbes, the highest paid YouTube stars we're going to take a look at. Number one, Mr. Beast, which is just general entertainment. Um... You know, I read a thing about him. He's into like Mr. Beast Burgers now. <laughs> where he's contracted with thousands of restaurants to sell Mr. Beast Burgers and he splits the profit with them. So he's general entertainment. He's making money outside of YouTube too. And then Jake Paul, um, boxing and entertainment. And, uh, you know, I don't know, much, I don't know much about these guys. I used to follow boxing a long time ago, but I don't anymore. Uh, but number two with uh, 45 million. Oh, by the way, Mr. Beast, 54 million. Jake Paul, 45 million. Then Markiplier, uh, General Entertainment, 38 million. And number four, Rhett and Link, with, you know, <laughs> I've seen a couple of these guys' uh, videos, and they're just, they're just nerd kings, the kings of nerd. So that's what their videos are based on. And they're earning $30 million a year. Then we have at Forbes number five, Unspeakable, which is uh, 
$28.5 million a year in gaming and entertainment. So, and at number six, Nastia, who was also on the other list because she's got a zillion, what is it, 84, 80, 80 some million followers. But she's earning $28 million a year for a little kid. I think she's, uh, I think she lives in the U.S. now, but she's either from Russia or Ukraine. I think she's Russian. And she's lucky she got out of Russia because today, which is March 4th, 2020, I'm sorry, 2022, Russia just banned Facebook, you know, for to keep Russian people from finding out what's really going on in Ukraine. Number seven, Forbes, is 27 million gaming and entertainment. This is Ryan Kaji, who basically, he started out with, you know, his parents filming him opening, opening presents. And how do I know that? Have I, ever, have I ever seen a video of his? No, I've, I saw him on, you know, Forbes list. I think he was like number two or number three at one time on Forbes list. But, you know, he used to open presents, you know, or open open boxes of toys and he would, you know, go crazy when he opens the box of toy, uh, a box with a toy, toy in it, and then he explains the toy a little bit and plays with it. Number eight, Dude Perfect. So this is a bunch of guys, not just one or two. I think it's five guys all together. And they are like sports comedy. So they're, you know, they're comedy entertainers and, you know, everything's sports affiliated. They're at 20 million at number eight on Forbes. Then we have Logan Paul, who's, you know, pretty famous. Him and his brother, we saw earlier, um, boxing and entertainment. Both of these guys were up high on the list, and then they got demonetized from uh, YouTube. And now they're monetized again and focusing mostly on boxing instead of drifting out to other areas that might get them in trouble. And in Forbes number 10, I'm sorry, uh, Logan Paul is an 18 million at number nine. And then at number 10... Preston Arsement, who is 16 million, and he is a, a video gamer. So that's our top 10 Forbes people. So 16 million dollars a year is the lowest, which is pretty good salary. You know, it's like professional football players make this kind of stuff. But again, these aren't necessarily the most important YouTubers either. You know. Most followers and highest income YouTubers, what's what's important is to know that many ordinary people can earn like $10,000 a month, $30,000 a month, or even, you know, $500,000 a year to a million dollars a year with, you know, YouTube, you know, as a side hustle. So YouTube is, you know, the basically the king of these uh, side hustles that will give you passive income because, uh, you know, We've just seen the biggest numbers going through YouTube. So we had a few examples, you know, that we started out with uh, affiliate marketing and then we went to uh, uh, masterclass type stuff and then now to YouTube. These are just three of many examples of, you know, side hustles to make passive income. And this channel will be focusing on side hustles. And, you know, you've just seen a glimpse, three of three of very many. Other side hustles to make passive income, Facebook. So Facebook is a biggie, you know, like YouTube. Um, I made a variety in my featured um, side hustles, in, you know, in the first set because, you know, master classes aren't that big, you know. You're not going to make much money on master class, I don't think. So, I, but I just threw it in there because it's a way of making money. And, you know, celebrities do okay. Uh, I don't know whether most people would. I don't know what I would do if I had to teach a master class. What would I do? I'm not a master at anything. I'm a, I can out engineer a lot of people and I file patents, but I'm not going to teach a master class in that. Maybe woodworking, maybe, uh, or tuning uh, certain vehicles, certain vehicles that I have that I can tune, that, you know, really well. <laughs> Um, so let's look at Facebook, uh, passive income from Facebook. So the number these, this is based on followers. Uh, so number one is Christian, Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, followers, 149 million. 
So, you know, he's one of the most famous athletes in the world. Vin Diesel, uh, number, oh, I'm sorry, Shakira, number two, had 114 million followers. And then Vin Diesel, number three, had 108 million. Lionel Messi, you know, I'm kind of surprised to see him as high as he is. Um, but, you know, he's got 104 million followers. And then Eminem, 93 million. Now, what does this what does this have to do with you? Nothing. <laughs> you don't need a million followers, you know, to to make money on Facebook. You know, twenty thousand followers would be pretty significant. If your if your Facebook was designed to make money instead of just you know spreading celebrity goodness, then you can make a lot of money. So it's not. You know, that's the same with the next few sections here. You know, you don't you don't need to have a zillion followers to make money. But, you know, Facebook is a way to make money. And I was listing the number one people in the other areas. So I had to list the number one people in Facebook. But that doesn't mean that you can't make, you know, decent money with, you know, a, a modest number of followers. So that's Facebook. And we have Instagram. Number one again, <laughs> Cristiano Ronaldo. So, you know, I don't know how many more years he's going to be playing, but he, he's probably going to stay in the sport. He'll probably be a coach or something, um, you know, or a spokesperson for something. He, he's a spokesperson for a lot of things now, but I don't know what he's going to do. I think he's going to retire in a couple of years, though. Number two, or let's look at numbers here. So, Ronaldo around 320. 312 million followers on Instagram. Number two, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, with 100 and, or 252 million followers. Ariana Grande um, with 250 million. Kylie Jenner with 247 mil million. The family does pretty well in top 10 in most things. All of them. <laughs> uh, Selena Gomez is number five here and she has I have to take a close look at this eh, 243 million I think so she's pretty close so you know and again in Instagram you don't need to have hundreds of millions of followers to make money your Instagram post should be geared at you know making money instead of you know spreading celebrity goodness <laughs> so uh, Instagram is a really good tool, you know, to make money. Then what do we have? Twitter. So number one in Twitter, Barack Obama. That's kind of surprising to me, but, you know, he was, I looked at a couple of these ranking services and he was ranked number one in all of them. So 130.1 million followers. Number two, Justin Bieber. Um, 114 million. I would have not guessed that he would be that high. Or Katy Perry, number three, because, you know, Justin Bieber and Kate, uh, Katy Perry are kind of, you know, I, I thought would somebody would have, you know, I think they're a little dated compared to some of these people. Well, so is Barack Obama. <laughs> Obama. Uh, Rihanna, number four, at uh, 103 million. And then we have Cristiano Ronaldo number five at 95.3 million so that's our people and I cut off I cut off Rihanna because that wasn't her picture there anyway and I had to slam in you know Ronaldo but this is Twitter and you know Twitter's another way of making money you use Twitter account to promote your other accounts you know like in affiliate marketing Twitter is a great way to promote affiliate marketing or Twitter is a great way to promote your Facebook account or Facebook is a good way to promote affiliate marketing. This, a, lot, a lot of this stuff is so interrelated. And then what do we have? TikTok, a bunch of people you never heard of. <laughs> I guess you heard of these people if you, uh, you know, if you're in college and, you know, you, you know, your college is number one person. So this is kind of crazy stuff. Number one here, a uh, girl named Addison Ray Easterling, and she's making five million dollars a year, and she's an LSU student. And I think there was a little blurb about her. It was like, you know, in one year, 
<laughs> she soared up to number one. Then who do we have? Number two is Charlie D'Amelio. I think is how you would say that. Number two at four million. Then Dixie D'Amelio. So I think they might be related. I didn't read anything about these people because just because. And then Lauren Gray, number four, and a guy named Josh Richards, number five. So again, TikTok is a great way to, you know, you don't have to be number one in the world. You don't have to be in the top, you know, 10,000 in the world. TikTok is a good way to promote your other things. Like, you know, um, TikTok can be uh, go directly to affiliate marketing to a product you have, or TikTok can promote your YouTube video. These things are, you know, all of these you know, side hustles are kind of interrelated. They can promote each other. You use one tool to promote the other one, and that's where you make money. Or you use, you know, and it's it's not always, you know, YouTube that makes money. You know, it's not always Facebook that makes money. So these are just tools that you use to, you know, point to something to make money. So that's why it's, these are all side hustles. These are paths to passive income to make you rich. So definitely, you know, I, I, I have a TikTok, but I haven't uh, done much with it. And I probably will be advancing to that later. A lot of people who are in affiliate marketing um, use, you know, Instagram and TikTok and stuff like that. But they're, it's not one of the first things you do to get going. You know, it's, it's something that you add on later on. So, and if I was going to do TikTok, I would do it with like a cartoon character or something so I don't scare people. <laughs> okay, so that's about all I have, and I appreciate your time. So this is the intro stuff, and the rest of the channel is going to be dedicated to showing you how to use the side hustles to make passive income. The end. So that concludes the um, presentation part of this video on passive income the side hustles. I appreciate your time.